All right. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on your time zones. So welcome to the international class of Temu Pendidik Nusantara. Thank you for coming in. My name is Diana, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session for the next one hour. I'm also here with Miss Anissa, which you cannot see because she's backstage, but nevertheless, she is going to accompany us and ensure all the technicalities in this session run smoothly. Okay, see if I have some greetings here. So, dear participants, if you already here, can you? Oh, okay. Uh, before I proceed further, I would like to say thank you to our partners, sponsors, and collaborators, which make Temu Pendidik Nusantara possible. So, thank you to our partners, Yayasan Guru Belajar, Kampus Guru Cikal, Kampus Pemimpin Merdeka, Teach First Indonesia, and Komunitas Guru Belajar Nusantara. Another big thanks goes to our sponsors, PT Nutrifood Indonesia, Keluarga Kita, Provisi, Indo Relawan, PT Paragon Technology and Innovation, PT Maruai Calls, and Kairo. Lastly, Temu Pendidik Nusantara is also held in collaboration with Komunitas Guru Belajar Nusantara, Persatuan Guru Nadlatul Ulama, Ikatan Guru Indonesia, Pusat Studi Pendidikan dan Kebijakan, Asosiasi Kepala Sekolah Indonesia, Asosiasi Pengawas Sekolah Indonesia, Federasi Guru Independen Indonesia, Persatuan Guru Seluruh Indonesia, Sekolah Literasi Indonesia, and Bantu Guru Belajar Lagi. So that's a pretty long list, and I guess that just shows the effort or the partnerships that it takes to drive education changes. Now, talking about education transformation, we have our two speakers here who are going to talk about the very same topic or closely related to it. Our first speaker is Kat Papilo from the United States. Kat is a writer, researcher. She has a newsletter called Adwell, which I think I can provide the link to in the chat box shortly. She has a newsletter called Adwell uh, and also writing a book about success stories in education systems change from Brazil, Colombia, Nigeria, Kenya, Pakistan, India, and Indonesia. So this might give you a hint about what do we mean with the term the global south for some of you that might not have been familiar with the term. And in fact, in this session, we have the opportunity to learn directly from her insights on what works in transforming education system, specifically in the context of the global south. Our next speaker is Ms. Pratasya Marvelarani, an early year specialist, also practitioner from Kinderland Preschool in Mandung, Indonesia. And we are fortunate to have her here as today she's going to share her expertise on the topic of project-based learning within preschool settings. All right, aren't you excited to learn from both of them? So without further ado, I would like to give the time to our first speaker, Kat, to start her presentation. Salamat malam, everyone. Sure. Diana can, okay. Salamat malam, everyone. So wonderful to be here with you um, this evening. Uh, my name is Kat, and I'm gonna be speaking today about what we can learn from the Global South's bright spots. And let me pull up my presentation. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about why I am speaking about this topic. So most of the time when we hear about education reform and the systems we can learn from, people point to the same countries, places like Singapore, Finland, Canada. And what I'm interested in is where are there places 
that are in the global south that have success. And so when I say global south, I mean Latin America, Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. And you'll see Indonesia's on my list and that we have a lot to learn from your country. And today I'm going to share what can we learn about how do we actually create success stories for education reform. So first, I want to take us back in time. So to show you that people have been changing education for a very long time, um, starting with the Gurukul system in India many years ago, uh, when religious gurus used to bring students in their villages to learn different religious and spiritual practices. And this was really the first um, oldest formal education system that existed anywhere in the world 5,000 years ago. We also had in Mexico, where the Aztecs um, system, they had the first universal secondary education system, where they taught students about identity and shared values through myths and songs. And then we also had Islamic education. So in um, universities and madrasas, um, next to mosques in Tunisia, Morocco, and Egypt, um, there were models of self-directed learning and students coming to learn about different Islamic principles. And these were really some of the first universities in the world. Um, you also had in the Mali Empire in West Africa in the 1200s, griots using stories to teach students about their history, and what they needed to know um, from a very long time ago. You also had stories being used to teach students how to write using hieroglyphics in Egypt from a very long time ago. Um, you also had some of the first forms of assessment and high stakes exams um, in China, in Vietnam, um, and you had training centers where students would come in ancient China to take assessments that determined whether they could become a part of the um, ancient Chinese civil service from a very long time ago. You also had the oldest university in the Americas, um, in Peru, University de los Andes. And you also had the second oldest university in Africa in Sierra Leone um, from 1827. Um, you had also the oldest university in Africa in Mali, University of Sankor. You also had centers for learning of uh, Buddhist spirituality and religion um, in Pakistan and India. And what we see from these is that, you know, we don't just have to learn from places like Harvard or Oxford or places in the US or the UK. In the Global South, we actually have a lot to learn from. And what I'm going to show you today is what are some of those different models for changing systems? So these are some of the places we're going to talk about. And the first learning is that it can be politicians who change systems. So this could be someone at a state or province level in Indonesia. This would be more similar to a district or a regency. But if you have a politician like a Bupati who decides that they want to prioritize education, they can really make change happen very quickly. So you have examples of this in Nigeria, in Edo State with Governor Obaseki leading lots of reforms to his system in partnership with an organization called New Globe. And they have, for example, one innovation of scripted lessons where every teacher is given a tablet where they have a curriculum and guides that tell them exactly what to say at what time um, and what assessments to do so that they can really progress students on a, on a, um, a journey towards mastery. And it's very interesting. Um, you also have examples in Pakistan and Punjab province, where the person who's currently the prime minister of Pakistan, Shabazz Sharif, actually led a lot of reforms when he was the minister of Punjab state. Um, for example, they had a tool that the government used to track how students were doing across all of the schools in that province so that the government could have a sense of which schools needed more help and which schools we're doing well. You also have in small countries, um, places like Sierra Leone, um, change happening. And so this picture is of President Bio, the president of Sierra Leone, 
And David Senge, who used to be the Minister of Education and who's now the Chief Minister, who in the past few years has been leading a lot of reforms. For example, um, he created an outcomes bond where uh, providers of services to teachers are actually rewarded if they're able to get stronger outcomes for teaching and learning quality. So the program incentivizes schools to improve and actors to help improve the system and they get rewarded for doing that. You also have a very famous case in Brazil called Sobral that we're gonna come back to later. But essentially part of what enabled this case was these two politicians who were a mayor and one later a governor of a state, their family had a lot of power um, over the politics in that area for many generations. And so they had enough power that they could decide, okay, we wanna prioritize education and we can make it happen. But also you can have nonprofits and companies lead change where there's not enough politicians who care about education. And so one example of this is the Citizens Foundation in Pakistan, which runs hundreds of private schools uh, based on a very affordable model. Most of the parents pay some sort of fees, some get scholarships, but it's, it's enough that they can usually afford to pay even the most low income families. And the Citizens Foundation has created this model with private schools but they've also now built their credibility so the government's coming to them to influence government curriculum. And they've done this in a context in Pakistan where um, you know, there was the war in Afghanistan going on across the border and they faced a lot of challenges as a country, but this organization has still managed to create a really high quality school model in many schools. You also have ed tech examples. So Nairobi in Kenya, where I lived for four years and I co-founded an organization, has a lot of ed tech organizations. For example, doing learning through mobile phones, like through texting, SMS, or WhatsApp. Um, and you have a lot of organizations that are creating change using different tools. The government also now is leading a big reform to transform the uh, curriculum to be more based on skills instead of memorizing content. And three things that enabled this process in Kenya were that the politics aligned and politicians in Kenya have prioritized education beca and because there is demand from parents, parents in Kenya really care about education issues. And there also is a whole ecosystem of innovation, enabling tech innovation um, in all sectors that has enabled innovation in education. And I have more articles about this online if you want to read more about the history of how that happened. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple of these. So another way that transformation can happen is through movements and coalitions of a group of people working together to create change towards a common goal. And you really see that this can have three different parts. So you have sort of a place that can enable a movement, the people who lead the movement, and a process of how it can happen. So I'm gonna talk about two different processes today. So some of the factors that we actually can't really influence that much are things like a place being a city. And I'm gonna come back to this in a second. But there actually is a lot that we in this room and all of you can do to really help enable coalitions and movements to happen. And so one example is where philanthropy and activists actually made a movement happen. And this is from Brazil. And this is an example where a group of people came together, um, this, this very wealthy Brazilian named Jorge Paulo Lehman came together with an activist um, who became head of his foundation. They decided they wanted to change Brazil's education policy. They wanted to change it so that it had a curriculum that was common across the country. And they mobilized a group of 70 people from across um, academia, like universities, nonprofit experts, government bureaucrats, politicians, to all collectively design this policy and advocate for it in every sphere that they could. And this took many years. So it took them five years 
from when they started and decided to prioritize this policy to when they actually got the policy um, written into law, but they did it. And you can see here a picture on the left, this is a coalition meeting. And on the right, you can see an example of how there were a lot of protests actually against this policy and it became a very intense process with lots of opposition, but the group was able to get it, um, to, get it to happen. Um, these are some of the examples of the organizations that were part of it. And another example is led by a political party in Delhi, India. And this is an example where um, the, the man in red here, Manish Sisodia, was part of an anti-corruption campaign that they then decided to launch into a new political party called Am Admi Party that ran for elections and they managed in a very surprise election um, to, to win power over Delhi, the city in 2015. And they decided they wanted to prioritize education and make it their most, uh, their biggest issue. And so they led all kinds of reforms. One is a happiness curriculum. And you'll see here on the left, this is Mr. Sisodia visiting a classroom and participating in students doing a meditation together that was led by students. And this is part of the happiness curriculum that they led. And they also have all kinds of reforms to teacher training and um, committees that lead schools. And they really transformed all the different elements of the system. And some of the factors that shape how these happen. So whether a place is a city, so Jakarta, for example, um, has more innovation happening um, than a lot of other places in Indonesia, just because of the fact that it has more people. Um, and also having economic growth and more philanthropists can also help because there's money for education. Um, also having a place with more social movements. So on the left is a picture of Paulo Freire, who was a Brazilian educationist who was led literacy campaigns for reading um, across the countryside in Brazil. Um, in the 80s. And on the right is Gandhi, who led the independence movement in India. And these are both examples of where Brazil and India have these long history of social movements that enable the coalitions that happen now. But often there's things you can't control. And this is where sometimes things just happen um, and you have to just go with it and learn to flow. And so, for example, the case in India of the party I talked about, the main leader of that was arrested because the party in control, BJP in India, of the central government, is trying to weaken opposition parties. And so they've faced this as a big challenge in the process. Um, and politics can really impact whether a movement is successful or not. So for example, in Brazil, the president, um, Dilma Rousseff, was impeached at one point so she was removed from office while this coalition was trying to implement, to advocate for their policy. And it's caused a big challenge for them because they had to learn how to adapt and find ways to exert their power, even through this process of the president going through a change and being removed. But they did do it. Um, it's also important to invest in leadership pipelines. And so this is why an organization um, like Teach First Indonesia is very important because leaders really do matter. And one lesson that we see is that having just three leaders can really make a difference because if, if just three people come together and decide that they want to help start a coalition for changing education, that can be enough of a spark to light a process. And obviously you need a lot of other factors to align but that spark really has the power to set things in motion. And in both of these cases, we see that just a few people were able to get it started um, and they were the ones who initiated. You also have, in both cases, organizations that were seeding different innovations and investing so that there were entrepreneurs creating different models. There were activists advocating for policies and there were funders supporting both of these processes. You also see the role of actually just exposing 
what's actually going on in a system. And so the politician in India talks about how he saw the data coming out of this study called ACER that was measuring how many students were learning at what levels um, in India. And seeing the crisis that was clear from that data was what made him decide to value education. So data actually really has a big role to play. Um, you also can spread activist skills and train people to do advocacy. Also having exposure to innovative schools really does matter. And so in India's case, a politician, Atishi, who was one of the key leaders in that Delhi reform, she actually was a teacher at an innovative school led by um, Krishnamurti, an educationist. And this is part of what shaped her to care about education. You also had examples where these leaders were going to different countries to visit and be exposed to what was happening in other places. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these. So we see that if a place has more coalitions, it's more likely to have some in the future. You also see the role that philanthropy can play. So I have a whole article about this, but there are all these different things that funders can do to make reforms more likely. And really this is about having more funders. So Tonoto Foundation, who you may know in Indonesia, is a great example of a local funder that is has a team who really knows the context they're working in and can adapt based on what happens. And so this philanthropy-led approach can be really powerful when it's local. Um, government can lead reform itself. And so this is an example in Sobral um, where a mayor basically decided he wanted to change his system. And he did all of these different things on the right to do so. And essentially the most important thing when I went and visited was that they have coaches. They have two coaches at every school and their full-time job is basically to sit in classrooms, observe teachers, and then give them feedback afterwards to improve. And having that feedback loop is really important and is a key reason, I think, why Sobral was able to transform their system. And they went from being one of the lowest performing municipalities in Brazil. Over the course of just a few years, they were ranked the top municipality in the entire country as a result of all these different things that they did. And it didn't cost them that much. They used the money that the government already had. Um, the current project I'm working on this book documents how all these different methods can be used. And so you'll see here, Minister Makarim, I'm very interested in the process that is unfolding in Indonesia and I'm writing about it and what's happening with ed tech and how government is using ed tech as a strategy I know there's a lot of complexities with that process. Um, and also you can see examples like on the top right, Bella Jamil, an activist in Pakistan, who's exposing to the government what they're doing well and what they're doing not well. And on the bottom right is a Kenyan entrepreneur named Wawira Njiru, who started a nonprofit that does lunch programs for schools, and she's grown it in partnership with government. So these are all examples of there's different ways to lead in a system. And what you have to decide for yourself is what kind of way do you want to lead? There's all different types of ways to do it, whether as a funder or starting a school or being a teacher in a government school, all of those different ways you can create change. And you have to decide for you what makes the most sense. Uh, I would love to connect with you further. So please find me on LinkedIn. You can follow me. I also have a newsletter and I share a lot of different articles and examples and different how-to guides on jobs, opportunities for funding, and also I'm launching courses soon to teach people. So please sign up for my newsletter. Here is the link. And I look forward to discussing your questions. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Kat. Many, many fascinating stories you shared with us. As an Indonesian and part of the Global South myself, I think I haven't been that familiar with 
what you've shared with us. So thank you. Will uh, dear participants, if you have any questions or any uh, thoughts, please write down on the chat box and we'll come back to that on the Q&A session. Next, we're going to learn from Ms. Tasha about incorporating global citizenship education uh, with a project-based learning approach within preschool settings. So Ms. Tasha, the time is yours. Hello, Ms. Diana. Um, Can you hear my voice? Yep, is it's it, clear. Okay, uh, I'm going to need your help because right now, uh, unfortunately, I cannot turn on myself. So please help to put on the slides, please. Okay, you can start from the first one, please. Right, before we start, I would like to introduce myself again. My name is Tasha. I'm from Bandung and uh, I'm actually currently working as a principal in the preschool. It's called Kinderland Preschool Bandung. So, wait, let me let's switch. Okay, so yeah, today I'm going to share a little bit about project-based learning approach for global citizenship education in the preschool setting. Well, before we start, I'm just going to share a little bit why, okay? Because as you can see, uh, earliest education is the basic foundation of all education, right? And then, um, and when you are in the preschool, basically you are, um, you are doing a role play, what's going on in the real world, right? So being a citizen of the world is actually uh, everyone's responsibility, including ourselves and of course all the students. That's why global citizenship education for us is very important. Yeah, however, when you are teaching the young ones, it's not easy to teach the concept that are not that cannot be seen because it's actually the concept of you cannot see it, you cannot actually uh, look at it. So we we want to try to share the concept and let them learn about it and let them to be introduced by having a project based learning that can be having it, we can have it by doing a, in a fun and a play-based uh, approach. Okay, so this is what we are going to share. Okay, second. The second one is Diana, thank you. All right, so before we continue, of course, I would like to start by the aim and definitions. So basically the definition of project-based learning is a process that fosters learners' engagement in studying authentic problems or issues centered on a particular project theme or idea according to the UNESCO and the global citizenships education aims to empower learners of all ages including of course the preschoolers to assume active roles both locally and globally in building more peaceful tolerant inclusive and secure societies so actually the basic concept of it of this learning is I we want to introduce them to be a good citizens of the world Okay, so next, please. Yes, so from there, the vision is, as was mentioned in research, the most important aim of social studies teaching in early childhood is to raise awareness of citizenship. So therefore, citizenship, citizenship education to equip children with the skills necessary to play an active part in society and act as, as socially and morally responsible citizens. Okay, can continue please. Next. Yeah, so this is like the idea of why we are doing it because citizenship education equip the children with the skills, the, the necessary skills. That's why we put the global citizenship education to be part of our learning every, I mean, it's part of the curriculum in our school. So we want them to be to build more peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, and, soci and secure society. But again, how? Again, it's not easy. As I mentioned before, we do it in a project-based learning. So therefore, we can see from the importance from that, uh, we conduct a project-based learning approach in our global education. I mean, global uh, citizenship education. Now, I'm not going to talk about the theory more. I'm going to share about it more about what we do at school. Okay, please continue, Miss. Okay, um, I, uh, we haven't started this year. Uh, we, we, I'm gonna share about what we did last year, last school year. 
Our project last year was about the climate change project based learning and the tra uh, Kanjuruhan tragedy. Because it have, we did it in October 2022. So the Kanjuruhan tragedy would, would, would actually, was actually happened on that time. So we want to let them learn about what is actually happening on the real world on that time. And we want to take the moral out of it and learn about it. Okay, next. Okay, this is the first project. It's called the Kinderland Save the Earth Project Based Learning. This program was conducted in October 2022 for raising the children's awareness to keep their only home. We want them to be aware that actually planet Earth is their only home. So we want them to have to, their awareness to keep the planet Earth clean and safe by having a series of activities that help the children to understand the importance to take care of the planet. The students, so the aim is, the students experience the learning in a different way, which is through project-based learning. So, so they can have a project that's been done together with their friends, which are cleaning the rubbish and sort the rubbish according to the rubbish bins and planting the trees and water to keep the school green. Next, this is the video. Oh. Okay, 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 just the first one. I hope it can. Yes, so we purposely made the, the school dirty. Okay, we put trash around the preschool and then we want them to see what should you do if there are lots of rubbish around the school. And so we ask them to come to the parking lot. Okay. So they get there to experience themselves and try to clean up the the the, the rubbish. Okay, they clean it up. Right, now the next one is after they've done that, we also ask them to learn how to keep the earth clean and safe, like by planting the trees. Right, so those two activities are done by the preschoolers, I mean the younger ones, the four to five year old. Can you please to go to the next uh, slide, please, miss? Right, so basically, as you can see from the photos here, they are actually learning to have a, um, a real action on how to keep the earth safe and clean. And then, um, yeah, and then they know how, they, they learn how to sort the rubbish because actually it is very important also now to sort to know how to sort the rubbish, not just throw it away. So actually this is a basic introduction, but 
again, it can help them to understand further next time when they see things outside the, outside the preschoolers, preschools again. Okay, uh, next please. Next page, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this is the final presentation. So we do an illustration of people being ignorant and so rubbish everywhere. And they know that that's not a good thing to do. And we... So basically, this one is the final presentation. Uh, we know, we understand that learning this kind of concept is not an easy thing, it's not an easy task. So we want them to learn uh, thoroughly by having it, like having a, ro a role play, having a hands-on, and by the end, I want, we, we want them to present what's their illustration about it. So um, we make this uh, final presentation by having a performance, and let them illustrate it on how to we can have the campaign about simple and easy ways to keep our plane our planet a safe place to live for all of us and basically to share the uh, the campaign that uh, you cannot wait others to clean up you know uh, to do the action we start from ourselves that's what we are campaigning about last year next right so now is the second project that we've done so this program was conducted also in uh, October 2022. So we took the most current issues on that day. That was about the Kan Kanjuruhan tragedy. I think everyone knows about it because it's a very it's a very overwhelming news about people. Uh, many innocent lives were taken, and it's very unnecessary. Unnecessary. So we were trying to share the simple concept for the kids to learn, which was about sportsmanship and sharing empathy by doing role play and sharing examples. So the aims are the students have the awareness about the current issues that are on the news, okay? So they need to know. And the students will be able to learn about sportsmanship, about cause and event concept, and also how to express their empathy to others. Right, next. Uh, yes. So this is, wait, wait, okay. Okay, the first one is this one.
so we try our best to make a role play about sportsmanship. Next is the second video. All right, that's the videos about it. And then can you please go to the next page? Yes, these are the photos. So basically what we are trying to do, what we were trying to do that time was we were trying to make a role play about what exactly happened on that time. And then um, we want them to understand that uh, we have to be very, we have to understand there's cause and effect. Like if you do things, you might make other people hurt. And then what will happen if you do that? Or we, we want them to have a very, I mean, it's also a very simple one in a simple, very simple way. We want them to understand on, base, on basic manners when you are being a supporter and how to share empathy when something happened. So we share the information that on that time, there are many people that are not ha are having a good time and then, there's there's this tragedy that made people die. So they also we also ask them to try to share their empathy and write their uh, empathy to the to the people that are actually affected on that time. So yeah, that's what we did on the uh, on our preschool uh, last year. Okay, and every year actually we did this in every different um, topic because. Uh, basically, we want them to understand that there are things happen in the real world, and uh, we will we try our best to do it in a very, uh, to make it simpler so the kids will understand in their own pace. So that's how we did it. Next, uh, next stage, uh, next page, please. So the conclusion of what I'm trying to say here. For us, we understand that children are best through role plays and hands-on activities, especially 
when the concept is actually vague or you mean uh, it's not it cannot be seen some concept that it's not really easy to share and then to face this 21st century climate change is actually important for the kids to be equipped and understand uh, about the ideas of climate change so they have to be equipped with the uh, knowledge about how to handle to take care of the planet earth since they are very, since they are very young and then other than to aim the main objective of the project based learning itself it also can be found that children also have others emerging skills in during the process because when you make projects you're actually doing it together with your friends right so the activities uh, includes other social emotional skills development such as teamwork patience, patience independence self-confidence and problem solving skills so it's actually uh, good in many ways for the kids to do this to do this and we did we do this usually uh, at the end of the semester so it's actually like uh, helping them to understand further about the things that they are actually learning and then lastly project based learning shares a lot of activities that enhance many of the children's skill development with a good aims and preparing them to be a good citizens of the world at the end so basically that's what we're, uh, what we are trying to do uh, in the preschool we are actually equipping them to be more ready to the next connect to the next education so we are trying to equip them more with more uh, skills to to be able to go further that's what we are trying to say so thank you for listening if any one of you want to have questions and have a discussion then you uh, let's do it thank you All right thank you miss diana all right thank you miss Patasha, for your presentation i see that some participants do appreciate the practices and so for example here miss nifa say thank you miss ratashia for the inspiration and also here mr irianto i think uh, he appreciates how the project-based learning makes the student more active in the classroom so thank you Ms. Ratasha. now that both of our speakers have shared their presentations we will proceed to the q and a session i will go first from a question for kat which comes from amalia so she thinks that in Indonesia, we still have challenge to increase students' critical thinking. What's your suggestion on that? Thank you, Amalia. I think that's such a great question. Um, so I think that actually it really links to um, Rathasia's presentation because I think that often it is about creating active learning so i think often students don't have enough critical thinking because they're taught to memorize content mm -hmm. and teachers are just standing up in the front of the classroom giving a lecture saying here's what you need to know write it down and then the students spit it out on the test and i think that that teaches students to just be robots who follow um instead of actually thinking critically and so i think that there's a lot of different strategies you can use to enable more critical thinking and i think project-based learning is one of those strategies so that was a great example with students at a younger age but you also can use project-based learning with older students and engage them in projects where they're working in a team to deliver and an outcome or they're having to go research a topic that they find interesting that they choose um there's all different kinds of ways you can do that and i think um some examples you can look at so the international baccalaureate curriculum is a network of schools around the world use it and that curriculum is one that i've seen that does a really good job of teaching critical thinking. Um, and so you can look online and there's a lot of resources out there about how to learn from international baccalaureate. 
Um, so that's that's one example I would point you to. And there's a lot of different schools across the world using it. I'm sure there's probably schools in Indonesia as well. Um, and I'll try to find one and put it in the chat. Um, but you definitely can do it. And I think particularly in Indonesia, where sometimes in the past, people were actually punished for criticizing the government or for having critical thinking. I think it makes sense that you know, there's not as much of a culture of that in general. And so I think it's up to you as teachers to create a new generation where students feel free to speak their minds and question the status quo and really engage really as citizens to create a better future. So thank you, Amalia. Great. Thank you, Kat, for your answer. Maybe Ms. Tasha wants to add since uh, project-based learning and the one approach that helps increase critical thinking? Yes, I believe so too, because um, maybe I'm talking about in a preschool mm -hmm. context, because um, especially when you are talking with the preschoolers here, yeah, with the young ones, they have their own, they have their own minds. If, although if you ask them to think in, in your way, they won't think in your way. They have their own minds. So it is, it is easier for us to actually share something and then let them learn about it by project based and doing a hands-on activities other than you actually um tell them what to do because when you do a project they can find out uh by themselves like they have their own learning in their own ways because when they do the project they can see the process they can see the 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 concept that they are actually uh, building by, by themselves. So for me, project-based learning is very important for the kids these days because um, we live in a world that we um, that they cannot just follow without thinking about what's going to happen next, in my humble opinion. So for me, uh, it is better for them to understand what is actually the concept itself rather than to, uh, to and then, really comprehending it without and then not not just doing it without i don't understand what is actually happening and just follow it so what we are trying to do is well for me in the preschool also we don't want them to learn by that way because it's actually not helping them in the future in my humble opinion so that's what i'm trying to say i want them to learn more with their own mind so they know what is right what is wrong and then um try to find the best ways for themselves Okay, thank you, Ms. Tasha, for yes. emphasizing the importance of active learning. So, Kat here has a resource that she wants to share, and I'm going to put it on the chat box. Would you like to elaborate more? What is this link about, Kat? Well, sure. I um, cannot open I, it. Sorry. We cannot open it though. Still cannot open it. I cannot click it. Okay. Maybe we need to copy and paste it by ourselves. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Please, I can't, sorry to interrupt your uh, conversation. No problem. Um, it was just a resource I found pretty quickly looking online. Um, and it has a bunch of examples of you know, models for critical thinking, lesson and plan examples, things like that. Um, but there are a lot of great resources online. And so I think, you know, it can just be a matter of going to Google and typing in um, resources for teachers to teach critical thinking. And there's a lot that comes up. So Amalia, there's a lot of good um, resources out there um, to help you with this. Um, and in terms of th helping you think about specific strategies. So um, there's a lot of help out there. And this is just one example. Yeah, great. Thank you, Kat. Ms. Tasha, do you have any additional comments? Oh, uh, no, no. I'm actually literally looking at it right now, Kat. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm actually open and trying to open it. So, yeah, actually, it's really helpful. Thank you, Kat. It's going to need uh, more resources for us to, to 
have a further re preference for our critical re uh, thinking learning, right? Thank you. Alex. Yeah, I will also definitely check the link. And as Kat said, there are many resources in Google. We can literally just type it. Okay, so Amalia and Margareta here appreciate for the resource that you share. Okay, now we still do have some time. So for all participants, should you have any questions, this is the right time to put down your question. And probably while we wait, um, I think it's interesting how Kat starts her presentation by saying, uh, we can learn a lot more, not just from like the UK or the USA, but also from countries from the world itself. And related to that, I think I want to, would you like to elaborate more? Uh, how do we strike the balance between embracing practices from other contexts, from different contexts, but also taking the time to understand or rooting for our local context? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because I think that it's important to to do both, right? I think that there's a lot we can learn from other countries. Um, and we can be inspired sometimes, I think, by seeing, wow, look at what they were able to do, you know, even in a place like Nigeria or Pakistan that has a lot of challenges. Look what they've been able to to create and achieve. And, and we can be inspired by that and take different lessons and tools. But at the same time, Indonesia has a really specific context. And even within different districts and regencies, there's very different contexts across the country. And so I think you have to um, go through that process yourself as a teacher or school leader of taking different practices, looking at what the government is telling you you have to do within the different requirements and test things out yourself and see what is actually working for your students. What doesn't seem to be working as well? What can you test and try, right? It's really about how do you um, innovate yourself and really see, okay, how do I see what's working, change it, improve on it, get feedback, and then try again. Um, and I think Rosacea School is a great example of this because mm -hmm. what we saw in all those videos was a school that was really testing and iterating different ways to help students learn, right? And obviously, you, we just saw one you know snippet into these different windows, but probably, I imagine, there was a lot of time leading up to those videos of the teachers figuring out what could work, looking at examples, writing the lesson plans, testing it out. That probably wasn't the first time, you know, that they had a lesson on students planting trees, for example, right? And so it takes a lot of work and innovation. Um, and and I really do think that, that, that that's so important. I was in Indonesia for two months in May and June of this year. And just in the short time I was there, I saw how so many of the regencies and districts are so different, right? In a country that has thousands and thousands and thousands of islands, there are so many different contexts across Indonesia. And so what works for you in a certain place yes. um, might not work for you know, a teacher that's teaching kids in an informal settlement in Jakarta. You know, If you're a teacher working in a really rural area that doesn't have as much access to the internet or wi-fi so it's going to be up to you to really see um what works and what doesn't and there's not a one one size fits all solution yeah. and also what's great about indonesia is you already have a lot of bright spots even across the country so we've seen some of those in this session today um but there's a lot happening and and part of why i think indonesia is really exciting is because you have um, this work that the government and the ministry is leading. Uh, you also have different nonprofits who are training teachers. You have different innovative schools. So even within the country, there's a lot you can learn. And it and this conference is an opportunity for you to 
to learn and see examples of what's going on. So I would encourage you to check out the other speakers um, and watch the other sessions too, because there's a lot you can learn from, from Bright Spots in Indonesia already. Thanks, Kat. Really appreciate that. So, um, Ms. Tasha, do you have any comments as teacher? How do you experiment, like kind of experiment to see what works and what doesn't in your classroom or your school? Yeah, actually, when I saw Kat's uh, presentation, it's actually really inspiring, Kat. I mean, like, people, uh, I, I, I actually haven't seen it directly from, uh, from under from your examples that they are actually doing a lot of things and it's very inspiring. And I, I quoted your words that say, three people can make a difference. It is actually, it's true. It does make a difference. And then also, and well, of course, there will be a lot of challenges among them. But then, of course, it's, it's really inspiring. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a matter about, uh, it's not a matter about whether you, uh, it's going to work or not. For me, it's about whether you want to try to make it work right so that's that's what inspired me the most about what you're trying to say in this uh, presentation before so what matters is that they are actually trying right and they are all mostly are countries from the south that uh, still in developing countries right mostly are the are those are the developing countries so and i was quite amazed when in nigeria that you said the parents are actually very concerned about education with their i mean like I, I'm, I actually don't know how is how is their demographic situation there, but then I I'm quite amazed because maybe they have other problems that because they are in a very developing countries, but they are still thinking about their children's education. That's another inspiring things that I really uh, you know hats off have the hats off for them because I believe they have lots of problem, but those uh, the that thing is really they're still thinking about it, which is very good. And then for me. Yeah, for me, it's really inspiring. Thank you very much. And then, of course, what you said about what is working in my place, it doesn't, uh, maybe it's not going to work in another place. Again, same. But but it's actually inspiring, you know, like when you, sh when you show it to me in other countries, they did it like that. Maybe it's not going to work in my place exactly, like if I did it the same way. But then again, again, the, the inspiration itself, which actually like ignite the 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 spirit of the the educator to do more i think that's 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 very nice it's really inspiring thank you kat thank you yeah and the example talking about the parent um yeah. engagement is so yeah. interesting um because yeah, yeah. in in kenya in particular you have certain areas where parents who really don't have that much money are very very low income parents exactly spending sometimes over half of their income on their children's school fees um, just yeah. because they really believe that if they are able to get their kid in a better school that that's going to change their kid's life and really um and solve a lot of the issues the problems that they have so it is very inspiring to yeah me. and it's a very good mindset i mean i i just can't believe for, with their situation right now like it's even like i think water is not easy thing for them right because they live in africa water is not an easy thing for them yeah they well, it, well it, it depends yeah it, it depends like even within um kenya you know you have some areas where there are higher income people who have uh, access to really good uh, water and you have some areas with more low income people it's a lot like indonesia and that you have this uh, sort of okay. high inequality with like mm. some really rich people some middle class some low income mm. um but yeah, for the for the for the people that I was talking about who are sometimes spending, you know, mm. so much of their income on education, mm. you know, they mm. would be making the equivalent of probably two US dollars a day. I'm not sure what that would be mm. in the Indonesian currency. Um, mm. but but not that much. And so and they're yeah, and they're and they're deciding to prioritize it, you know, yeah, and not really necessarily good. spend as much on food or water or yeah. housing or these other issues. Um and there's a whole bunch of reasons why Kenya yeah. is like that, but it sort of has to do with the history of the country. But, um, but yeah, it's very, it's very inspiring. Yeah, and very I think inspiring. one thing, one thing I wanted to mention too, with Indonesia that I found really interesting when I was there was that um, it's really the Bupatis that can make a huge difference. So when I was um, talking about the role of politicians and things like what I saw in Indonesia was if you have 
a Bupati who decides they want to work on education issues, you really can have a lot of change in a district and a regency. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's not that many Bupatis really where they really care that much about education. But if you think about you as a teacher or leader trying to change a system, that might be a way to go is really how do you influence what's happening in your regency or district and what the Bupati is doing? Um, because if you can influence what they're doing, you really can create change across schools mm. in that area because Indonesia is so decentralized, you know, the, <laughs> the ministry itself doesn't actually have that much power. So, yeah. um, so I think if you think about even the ways to create change, you know, in Indonesia, it's, it looks very different politically than in a lot of the other countries that I've mentioned, but there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's just a matter of whether you want to do it or not. It's actually from there, right? like what you said before from your presentation. It's very clear. Thank you very much. <laughs> Start from yourself, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks, Kat yeah. and Ms. Tasha. I enjoyed to see your both of your discussion, but it turns out that we already passed one hour. So we've come to the end of this session. I know it can often feel like there are countless things to consider and discuss when it comes to education. So please, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, but before that, I think I want to bring up this comment from Ibu Dewi. If the party was a teacher before, maybe he or she would be more engaged in developing the education. So that's a good point from Ibu Dewi. Hi. Okay, so again, let's uh, keep the conversation going. One way to do that would be to subscribe to CAT's newsletter, the Upwell newsletter. And also, we can find out more about project-based learning, like what is implemented in Miss Tasha School. And please share your thoughts, reflections, insights that you've got from this from this session on your social media. So thanks again to all our speakers and participants. We look forward to seeing you at Puncak Temu Pendidik Nusantara on October 21st, 2023 at Gelora Bung Karno, Jakarta, Indonesia. Thanks again. Have a nice for us. Have a nice day. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.